When Israel came forth from Egypt, it was a long journey through the desert, 40 years. All the adults who left Egypt never made it to the Holy Land except Caleb, Joshua, and uh, one other. That was it. All the adults who had left Egypt died in the desert because they had uh, continuously showed a lack of trust in the Lord and so forth. It wasn't an easy journey. And when they arrived at the Holy Land, it was not an easy journey either. It wasn't like they just kind of walked in and said, okay guys, we're home. They had to actually fight for the land that God promised them. It was theirs by right, because God owns all things and God gifted them it to them, particularly this promise to Abraham and so forth. So it was their land because only God had the right to give away land. <laughs> and so God was giving it to his people. And so they had a fight for a bit of it to get control of it. Uh, they had to fight the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Moabites, the Jesuits. Oh, no, no, the Jebusites. <laughs> the Jesuits weren't there yet. Uh, they had to fight these various battles to take their land. And, um, and it was a slow conquering. It took some time before they actually captured the city of David, what's known as the city of David, or Jerusalem itself. And so it was under King David that they captured the city of Jerusalem, and that's where David established the kingship, was there in Jerusalem. Why was it so important? Because it was on that mount that Abraham offered the sacrifice of bread and wine with Melchizedek, which would become the place of the mountain site of the temple, and eventually the mountain site, the mountain range, where our Lord would offer himself in sacrifice. So it was important, this city of David, this Jerusalem, this fight, this battle to get this particular land. So when David finally had the time and the ability, and had a little bit rest from his enemies on his side, he decided he'd bring the Ark of the Covenant, which had been with them since the desert time, into Jerusalem and establish it there on the mountain, which where the temple would eventually be built by his son Solomon. So David comes bringing it in, and he has 30,000 people with him. I just double-checked it in scripture. 35,000 people were out to celebrate the moving of the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. And that's where that fellow decided Uzziah, uh, the Ark that was being carried on a cart by some ox, got a little unsteady, and the guy reached up, touched it, and died because he wasn't worthy to touch the ark. He was unclean, he should not have touched it. Um, although he was trying to do a good thing, it wasn't his to do. And so he was struck dead. And this frightened David. Here this great celebration of 35,000 people out in the street celebrating it, and somebody drops dead for touching the ark, which told the people it's about its holiness and how sacred it was. And David rightly becomes afraid. His fear was a fear of God, a fear of his own unworthiness. It was an awe of God. It wasn't the fear of like being afraid of getting bitten by a dog, like the fear of self-defense, which is a different type of fear than the fear of God. To be afraid of God, to be in awe of God, of God's majesty, is a form of humility. It's a form of recognizing that he's God, I'm not. That's a great line from that movie, Rudy, when the priest says to Rudy, there's two things I learned in life. There is a God, and I'm not him. <laughs> right? And so there's this reality that he's God. I'm not, I'm nothing, I'm no one. That's what David experiences his, his nothingness. Even though he was anointed by God, even though he was declared king, even though his descendants would reign forever, he still felt himself unworthy to take the Ark of the Covenant into his house in Jerusalem. And so he sends it to somebody else's house. The guy must have been like, thanks. <laughs> you know, like, okay, come on in, put it over there. Yeah, nobody touch it, okay? Nobody touch it. And uh, so the ark comes to his house. And his, this fellow's house was in the hill country of Judea, just outside the city in the hill country. Very significant for future events. And there it is for three months when finally the, David sees how the man's being blessed. And then David brings the ark into the city of David, and he does so with dancing and so forth, and his wife gets all upset at him. He's like, hey, I don't care. <laughs> it's like, I'm dancing before the Lord. with this joy where David is found worthy to bring the ark of the covenant into his house. It has everything to do today with Joseph. Everything to do with Joseph today. Joseph is a good and righteous man. It says in Scripture, he was a righteous man. 
Okay? The very fact that Joseph is a righteous man, and Scripture describes him as a righteous man, means that he was a man who observed the law. He observed the law of Moses faithfully. He was a devout Jew. He observed the law. He was a, others would describe him as a just man. To be just uh, means that you have true justice. And the first justice begins with justice towards God. Right? God has a right to my worship. God has a right to my adoration. God has a right to my life. In justice, I owe God everything of who I am. And so a just man will follow the law perfectly because he truly is giving God what is his due. In moral theology, we call this the virtue of justice. Our religious vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience come under the virtue of justice. That when we vow to God to do something, in justice we must fulfill that vow. That's a matter of justice. Right? This also comes under the virtue of religion, but it's a virtue of justice of like God has a right to what I vow to him. Joseph, as a just man, in justice, observes the law. And so when he finds out that Our Lady is pregnant with child, he had the obligation to expose her to the law. If he believed that she sinned, he would have exposed her to the law. As a just and righteous man, he would have brought her before the, uh, the set, or whoever, the, the high priest, and accused her of her sin. That would have been the just and righteous thing to do. He doesn't do that. He decides to divorce her quietly. Why? Because he does not believe that she sinned. Joseph did not think that Our Lady sinned, and that's why he was divorcing her. This is a misconception that has gone on, particularly in our modern world, that Joseph was afraid that Mary sinned, and that's why he was divorcing her. As much as I enjoyed the made-for-TV movie, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, which was phenomenally well done, one scene I hate is Joseph being angry and yelling at St. Anne, I promised you I never touched her! He didn't think that about her. When he was engaged to Our Lady, according to the mystics, he was one of the men that was chosen to come forward and present their staff to see who would it be who would be, who would be chosen to marry her. She grew up mostly in the temple. Don't forget, she, all, she consecrated herself to God at the age of three in the temple. She grew up in the temple among the children who were taught there. So she was known to the high priest. She was known to the priest there. And she was intending to enter a virginal marriage. This is something that goes back to the Deuteron Deuteronomy. You can read about this in the early parts of Scripture about those women who decide to remain virgins. There is a wedding, but the wedding is more of a contractual wedding for the protection of the virgin. And so Our Lady was entering into a virginal marriage. Joseph presented his staff, and his staff flowered lilies which is why he was chosen, which is why you often see St. Joseph with the staff in bloom with lilies. He entered into that relationship, into that engagement, knowing it was going to be a virginal marriage. He also knew, maybe not all of who she was, he didn't know she was the Immaculate Conception, he didn't know that she was going to be destined to be the Mother of God, he didn't know all that part of it, all he knew was that the woman he was marrying was particularly holy, she was set aside for God, and so if he believed that she had sinned. He would have exposed it to the law as a just and righteous Jew. Because justice would have demanded that. Because that's what the law said. And that law was given by God. So as a just and righteous man, he would observe the law and would have exposed her. He doesn't because Joseph does not believe that she sinned. Joseph believes in the Incarnation. When Our Lady, however Our Lady said it, I wish we did have that conversation. How much easier would make this sermon if we had the conversation between Our Lady and St. Joseph and Our Lady telling St. Joseph that she conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, the angel Gabriel had come to her. I would have loved to have known Joseph's reaction. However, uh, we have no words from Joseph, so he probably would have been, hmm. <laughs> and I think that was his response. Like, you know, when this revelation is made to him, Joseph, in humility, does the same thing his great, 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 great grandfather did. He doesn't believe himself to be worthy. Just as King David did not believe himself to be worthy to take the Ark of the Covenant into his house, 
So St. Joseph does not believe himself to be worthy to take the new ark of the new covenant. She who is truly the ark, she who is she was symbolized by the ark. The ark symbolized her. The temple of God symbolized her. And he was not worthy to have her into his house. So in humility, he decides to divorce her quietly. In other words, I'm not worthy of this. In his humility, this is the beauty of the humility of Joseph. I'm not worthy. How beautiful this humble man. Because even the angel, when, she said, when he says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. That word afraid, that word fear, is not the fear like being afraid of being bitten by a dog. Or the fear of falling off something. It's the same word for fear, which is a different word in Hebrew, for being afraid of being bitten by a dog and the fear of reverence for God. It was the fear of reverence, the same word that was used for King David. The same word. Joseph is afraid, just as his great-grandfather was, with a reverential fear that he was not worthy to have God come into his house. Not worthy to receive the Ark of the Covenant. The true Ark of the true Covenant. And so he wants to divorce her quietly. And as the angel has to say to him, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And so beautifully, Gabriel calls him Joseph, son of David. I mean, he's the great, 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 great grandson. But basically saying, Joseph, heir to the throne, you who should be the king of Israel, do not be afraid, son of David. Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife at home, for it is through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived in her. She will bear a son, and you ought to name him Jesus. How beautiful as it is assigned to Joseph to give the name to Jesus. You ever think about that? The first one to speak Jesus' name in public. When they ask what child name you give your child. And Joseph is one who has the honor to first speak his name in public. Yahshua, God saves. The beautiful moment when Joseph was able to proclaim to the world with the Son of God in his arms, God saves. And there in the arms of Joseph being presented, is the Savior of the world. God made man. She will bear a son, and you ought to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from his sins. This honor given to Joseph to be not only the foster father of our Lord, but to be the caretaker of the most precious gift that God had to give to the world, the two most precious gifts, his holy mother and the child Jesus. To Joseph was given to protect the one prophesied in the book of Genesis. The woman who would crush with her son the head of Lucifer. Given to Joseph to care for the one prophesied in the book of Isaiah. Of the virgin who conceived the son. It would be to him entrusted this incredible gift to protect, to care for. We go back to the book of Genesis and how God told Adam that he was to protect everything that God had given to him. Right? All of and here, Adam just had all of creation to care for. Joseph has the Son of God to care for, the creator of the creation. He has a far more bigger job than Adam. Adam had the whole world to care for. Joseph's got the creator of the world to care for, and his mother. I mean, this is a big task given to this man. You can see why he was like, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, like, I'm just going to step out. It's interesting, too, because Our Lady will then go to the hill country of Judah. She'll make the same journey as the Ark of the Covenant. And she'll go stay with the, uh, John the Baptist family when John is born and so forth, right? So she makes the same journey and then comes into the house of Joseph. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. He's told the prophecy. God is with us. Now, we hear the term for all the time. God is with us, Emmanuel. Oh, because we become so familiar with it, we forget about how serious those words are, how powerful those words are. For us, okay, God is with us in the world, yes, God is with us in the beautiful gift of the Eucharist and the tabernacle, yes. This is the first time, this is the first time that God enters our world. He's in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary at the time that God is speaking to Joseph, or the angels who have been the message. He's within her womb. He's growing within her womb at this moment. He's already present in the world when he's told God is with us. 
Now Joseph will speak those words, I'm sure, a billion times. Day in and day out as he comes in and out of his own home from the carpenter shop back to his house, God is with us. At the dinner table, God is with us. You know, at the breakfast table, God is with us. On their journeys to Egypt, God is with us. On their journey home, God is with us. Right? Wherever they went, the child Jesus was with them. God was with them. No wonder his fear, those three days, they couldn't find him. They're searching for him. And finally they find him, and once again, God is with them. It was significant for us because God became man and is dwelling among us. More significant for Joseph because he was under his roof, God himself. How beautiful this the gift that was given to him. Uh, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him. He did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him. This righteous, obedient man. He took his wife into his home. And by taking her, he took also the Son of God present within her. How beautiful this reverence Joseph has, this holy and good man. A man truly chaste, truly pure as can be. We have these, uh, again, these modernists in a church who have continually tried to denounce the lady's perpetual virginity. This is something Our Lady of Fatima asked one of the five, one of the reasons for the five first Saturdays in reparation was one for those who denounce her perpetual virginity. Joseph never touched her. She was a virgin before, during, and after the birth of Christ. Her, her uh, physical virginity was maintained even in the birth of Christ. This is a dogma of the church. And these theologians out there, these people out there, oh, you know, after Jesus was born, of course they had other children. No, they did not. Joseph was a righteous and just man. She was the holy of holies. Only the high priest enters the holy of holies. And the high priest was in the womb of Our Lady. She was truly the holy of holies. It was his job to guard her, to protect her, and to see that she was, her, uh, was, was cared for her whole life. He was a holy, pure man, truly chaste, truly good, truly holy, and had the most holiest of deaths that anyone could ever ask for. He died in the arms of Our Lady and Our Lord. He closes his eyes on this world, beholding the two of them. Someone once said, well, did Jesus die when did Jesus cry when Joseph died? Well, if Jesus wept so bitterly when Lazarus died, and people said, look how much he loved him, could he have opened, he opened the eyes of the man, of the, of the blind, and something to help his friend? If he cried that much at Lazarus' death, could you imagine that Joseph? He loved Joseph like a father. He, Jesus used the same word for Joseph that he used for God, his own father. His father from all of eternity, Abba. He used that same word Abba for Joseph. You're telling me he didn't have an emotional attachment to him? <laughs> right? The man who held him, carried him, loved him, kissed him, the man who, who, who taught him to work with his hands, even though he already knew. <laughs> like this man who he subjected himself to, and who cared for him so much that Joseph would not have this intense love him and Jesus would have this intense love for Joseph. You know, when James and John asked to sit at the right and left hand of Jesus in the kingdom, he's like, you don't know what you're asking. And then he's like, you know, it's been reserved for others. And as much as I like to say it's for Our Lady and St. Francis, it's not. <laughs> it's for Our Lady and St. Joseph. Our Lady sits at our Lord Jesus Christ, right? But Joseph had his left. How could he not? How could he not give that seat? to the man who loved him more than any man ever has. And no man, no man has ever loved Jesus Christ as Joseph loved him. No man knew him as well as Joseph knew him. No man was privy to 30 years of constant conversation with the Son of God. No man was privileged for 30 years to sit and listen, to behold him, to gaze upon him, to watch him throughout the night as he slept, to rise in the morning 
to receive a smile and a kiss from the Son of God. No man was ever given the gift to be able to kiss the face of God, except for Joseph. Moses couldn't even look upon the face of God, lest he die. And here is Joseph kissing the face of God. The man even kissed it by God. Right? The he whom the earth, who, who, who held the world in his hands, Joseph held in his hands. How beautiful this wonderful Saint Joseph. Today as we make our journey towards Christmas Day, we think about this beautiful gospel passage. Let's look to Joseph to learn so much from him. To learn humility, to learn love of God, true reverence for God, that true fear of God, to learn from Him how to truly be pure and holy in our lives, how to really love and care for and be devoted to the Blessed Virgin Mary, how to take Our Lady into our home and by bringing it of our heart, and by bringing Our Lady home to our heart, that she would bring Jesus to our hearts with her like He did, she did in the home of Joseph to truly spend our lives protecting and defending our Lord Jesus Christ and Our Lady, right? To truly spend on protecting and loving her and our Lord Jesus Christ. And ask Joseph to teach us how to love Christ as men, right? to teach us to, to truly care for Him in the way that He did. That he made alive within our hearts such incredible love for Jesus that we might love Him best we can, as Joseph did, this good and righteous man. Our Lord said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. May the Holy Spirit today give us a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, that we may be as righteous as St. Joseph, and found worthy to take into the heart, our hearts, of, our home of our hearts, Our Lady and the Son of God that we may be found worthy to receive him. May God bless you. I'm Eric.